being a gobbler, everybody took pride in it. You know, all things are possible unto those who believe. If you look back, there were no superstars from the world. They were team people. You're a gobbler, and it's a team. You could be the best athlete in the world. You had to play team ball there. Those kids in that streak wasn't going to let it in. What disappointed us was the 45. When now, sure, we would have had the championship with it. All of us are gobblers, and we'll be gobblers for life. I think we played for the state championship 10 times since 1970. Odessa Permian has played 11 times uh, since the history of the school. The Legends of Texas High School Football presents the Quero Gobbler Story. You were 14 points down before the game ever started because you were playing Quero. They sold tickets downtown, Joe Keesler's, and people would line up like 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning to be in line to get uh, out of town tickets. When they got into the playoffs, there would be, I don't know how many chartered buses would come out of Quero. The thing was the last man out of town turns off the lights. They didn't have a badge on saying I'm a winner, but it was that loyalty and tradition. From year to year, it was so thick here, and the town's backing of it the same way. That contributed to it greatly. If you're going to win, you're going to have players out there and kids that want to play. I found a father back in 69 or 70, and they were busted giver. There were three things we knew about that were for sure, and that was that that practice field out there and that game field were our heaven. Dave Campbell's Texas Football Magazine was our Bible, and Buster Gilworth was our God. It was like uh, hometown America for us, you know what I mean? The story that you wrote out, just everything became perfect. Uh, you know, the, the town just embraced us and said, uh, here we go again. We're always right there and making a playoff run to the state final. You know, it's like we live it. It's not just a, it wasn't just a game to us, it's like this is what we did. It's a place that knows how to win, and the community believes in winning, and they will support you and their kids. They made sure that you had whatever you needed, and uh, we, we didn't lack for anything when I was here. We had a great team, all the way from the coaching staff down to the ball boys. I mean, everybody knew their job. They knew exactly what they were supposed to do, and they did it. The kids don't really grow up wanting to be uh, Longhorns and Aggies. They grow up wanting to be Quarrel Gobblers. Like Buster Gilbert, Larry Pullen, Pat Blessing, and Mickey Finley, they've set a precedent. It's important to uh, live up to that standard and, and to continue that tradition. You know, that's why tradition never graduates here, because every group that comes through, they want to be a part of that tradition. They want to make their mark on that tradition, and, and it seems like over the years, that's what a lot of our kids have done. Let's go play for each other, go play for our community. Let's get after it today, okay? And this is what Gobbler football is all about. It's what playing in Gobbler Stadium is all about. But understand, embrace it. You don't get many opportunities to do this. You put in a lot of work, and not many times that you go get to go get a reward. One, two, three gobblers. Welcome to the Legends of Texas High School Football, the Quero Gobbler story. We're here at the Quero Daily Record, established in 1894. In fact, I've got a copy here from 1895. Yes, I said a copy. It's a kind of a copy of a copy. But they weren't even playing football then. Of course, that would later come in 1911. The Quero Gobblers had their fair share of successful football teams from each of the first five decades. Some of the early stars in Quero included Gerald Weatherly, who went on to play for the Rice Owls and the Chicago Bears. Lou Main, known as the Quero Crusher, played for the Texas Longhorns and won a 1947 championship with the Cleveland Browns. The world got to know Quero Daily Record reporter Roland Kenneth Towery, who won a Pulitzer Prize for a series of articles exposing a scandal in the Veterans Land Program in Texas. Did you know Quero even had an Olympic gold medalist? Fred Hansen played four sports and helped the Gobblers win a district title in football in 1957 before global success in track and field in the 60s. Played baseball, ran track, football, and basketball. Quero High School football coach was Langdon Smith. Dick Brooks was the B team coach. Langdon Smith was the track coach. I was left halfback, and Barry Copenhaver was the right halfback. Donald Calk was fullback, and Bill Dietz was the quarterback, winning the district championship in football and baseball for Quero. But my senior year in 59, I won the broad jump state championship, and I won the pole vault state championship. Hansen had similar success at Rice University, winning Southwest Conference titles in the pole vault and broad jump before getting his shot at Olympic gold in 1964 in Tokyo, Japan. 
Hansen endured a 10-hour pole vaulting contest, defeating a man from West Germany to claim the gold with a jump of 5.28 meters. It was a relief, actually, because we'd been out there so long and it was nerve-wracking. I mean, it's uh, stressful. Of course, I was elated and happy. 43 years as a professional dentist has been good to Fred Hansen, who has a beautiful ranch about 15 miles northwest of Cuero. Our family's been in the ranching business for over 100 years. You know, if it wasn't for Cuero and the background that I had at Cuero High School with all my friends and the coaches, I wouldn't have been prepared to do what I did at the, in college and Olympic Games. How about a little history lesson for you? This particular pump jack is pumping oil at about 13,300 feet below the surface, which is about two and a half miles. Now, keep this in perspective. The Eagleford Shale rolls all the way from Columbus, Texas, all the way down to Catula, right around DeWitt County, which is, of course, right by Cuero. This is oil country, and it's been very good for the folks who live in Cuero. You know who else was good for Cuero? William Buster Gilbreth, who played six-man football in Smiley, Texas as a quarterback before becoming an assistant coach at Freer. Buster would later become a head coach at Poteet, Cotula, and San Antonio Kennedy. Then it was off to Cuero where Buster would make history. Buster came in, 69, got real serious, you know, it was, it was very physical. Gilbreth was hired in the summer of 1969 with a goal to play the best player available, no matter the race, religion, or family background in a time of desegregation. If you wanted to find the blacks in Cuero, you had to go across the tracks, they called it. You wasn't allowed to come across the tracks at that time. So he brought it all together and all of a sudden, during this football time, the blacks, the white, it didn't matter what color the football player was, we got along, we had a good time, not knowing that it was making history, really, for his quarrel. If I'm gonna cook the quarrel, gobblers, I don't care who you are. I don't care who you are. What color your skin is. It just didn't make any difference to me, the color of your skin. How much money you got. I don't care where you come from. I only play the best. I'm gonna play the best player. If you're good, you play. If you don't, you sit on the bench. That's what I think about Coach Gilbert. He's one hell of a guy. The world was in turmoil. A lot of people that we knew from other teams around the small area around here had dissension on the team, whether it was racial or whatever. We never had any of that. He kept us insulated from all of that. As we began to play football together and started to winning, we saw for the first time we'd seen the stands, whites and blacks sitting together. It wasn't a black or white thing at that point. It just became a fact of we were Quero Gobblers and we could be the best. Everybody is exactly the same. We're Quero Gobblers. The first of three state championships is on the way as the Gobblers seek perfection. Located in the heart of South Texas, Quero is 90 miles east of the Alamo City. The historical courthouse is one of many classic buildings in the DeWitt County seat. With close to 7,000 residents, Quero is home to great schools, health care, and city parks. You can even kayak down the Guadalupe River. The wildflower capital of the Lone Star State has great economic development incentives to help new businesses thrive. Quero, the heart of South Texas. Introducing the Jet Angler, the ultimate top water fishing experience. For more information, visit us online at jetangler.net. Claycomb Associates was founded over 30 years ago with a single guiding vision, designing schools with kids in mind. They have been professional, easy to work with, have always met our deadlines and gone above what we've asked. They've exceeded our expectations as far as uh, continuing to work with us on a daily basis in every way possible. Claycomb Associates is passionate about supporting initiatives and designing schools with kids in mind. Explore South Central Texas's proud ranching heritage at the Chisholm Trail Heritage Museum in Cuero. It's the real cowboy story, no bull, where authentic artifacts, a chuck wagon, interactive kiosk, and more tell the vivid story of the great cattle drive era beginning in 1866. A further glimpse into the cowboy style of expert craftsmanship across Mexico through the Americas is featured in the Horsemen of the Americas exhibit of antiquities from the famed Tinker Collection on permanent loan from the University of Texas at Austin.
Welcome back to the Chisholm Trail Heritage Museum here in Cuero. After the Civil War, a huge market for beef opened up in the northeastern United States. The cattle were driven through Cuero all the way up to Abilene, Kansas. The Chisholm Trail was born. Eventually, the railroad penetrated into Texas and there was no longer a need to drive cattle to Kansas in order to ship them to market. Like those early settlers in DeWitt County 100 years earlier, times were tough in that first season at Cuero in 1969. Without an off season to work with, Gobbler's head coach William Buster Gilbreth had to get to know his personnel on the fly, but he had hired a good coaching staff that brought discipline to the Gobblers. That laid down the foundation for a successful future. So I brought Skeets Powers and Charlie Brown. When I got here, uh, Wilfer Block, who was a Cuero boy, was here. Of course, Lanny Haverman was here, but I knew I had four Cracker Jack coaches. Oh, he had a great staff, and they believed in hard work, and we, off-season was brutal, very strenuous, and he had high expectations for each and every one of us. Buster had the, the, the staff to, to just look at everything that's here on the table and pull all that together. He helped me to become a player, a football player. That is really what made us champions. Keith Powers was the, was the tyrant. You know, he was the one, the animal trainer, I called him. But they all loved him, but he was, I don't know if I could have played for him. He was really tough. And then Buster would, would be the one that talked to him, say, you know, you don't want to quit. You want to come out here and be a part of this winning program. Good coaching staff has got to have people like that. Coach Block was the father figure. Coach Powers, he was the disciplinarian. I can remember messing up one day in practice, and he dropped me to fourth string and I had to work my way back up. He'd chew you out one minute, hug your neck the next time, but he was just the kind of guy the kids loved. Coach Power, oh my God, he was a Marine drill sergeant. You know, you know what Marine drill sergeant would do? Oh man. Skeet Powers, Lord have mercy. <laughs> Woo! I was so afraid that man, you bless his soul, but he was one tough, outstanding coach. Buster once told me, the kids, I don't care if they like you. You're here to coach them and make them better. They are supposed to like me. The Gobblers finished three and six with a tie in that first season, but the stage was set for a run in 1970, which began with an off-season weight program. Buster installed his off-season program that weeded out the guys that really weren't dedicated to the game and the ones that were. We had overhand bars that we had to climb. Everybody's hands were blistered, and we didn't have weights at the time, so Somebody came up with the idea of making weights out of coffee cans, putting bars in them, and we had to run like 20 yards, pick up the bar, and lift it so many times and, and, and do that, the lift of the football field. So I think that that made us tough and it made us very competitive when we came out to play. I just think that it's a program that you have to have to be able to put a winner out on a football field. We spent a whole year in the program and we were determined to be successful. And our goal then was to win the district. Cuero had not won a district championship since 1957. If you didn't win the district, you weren't in the playoffs. All games counted with Buster Gilbert and it started in the off season. Cuero started the season two and three, but finished strong, winning four of their last five games to force a three-way tie for first in the Class 3A District 14 East Zone. Coach Gilbert told us, uh, y'all win this game for me tonight, boys. It'll be a three-way tie, and I promise y'all I'll win a flip tomorrow. Floorsville, Samuel Clemens, and Cuero, all four and one. Three quarters, but only one will decide the fate of Cuero in nearby Nixon, Texas. Here's Buster Gilbreth. Of course, I know both of the coaches, and I said, well, there's three of us, odd man out. Odd man goes. We flip her up and hit the floor, and I'm tails and their heads, and I'm going. And sure as heck, he wanted to flip. And that was all that was said. We shook hands and cussed each other a little bit, and, and we, we came back home. Well, we pulled up to turn right, well, Henry Shepard and those boys pulled out in the middle of the street and stopped, and heads come out of every window. Henry, of course, he yelled, what happened? I said, I'll see you at the field house in the morning at, at nine o'clock. Well, that old, that old Buick just went wild. They jumping up and hollering. Little did anyone know at the time what a huge impact the coin flip would have on Cuero football the next decade. You know, careers were made, careers were ruined on a flip of a coin on the main street of Nixon, Texas on 1970. My father and my uncle were sitting there getting ready to go deer hunting the next morning. They were just kind of waiting for me to come in. He said, you won the flip. I had to go to practice that morning. You gave up a lot of things to play football for Coro, Texas. 
The thing that I think Buster instilled, maybe that we didn't really have a grasp on, was how to win. The good teams find a way to win in the end. To be a winner, you have to be together as a team. And we had that chemistry together. We had that love for each other. We played not only just for Buster, but we played for each other. He said, you guys can grow your hair till you lose. I went in and told the guys, I had never cut my hair since. Well, they started with like a military haircut. From there, <laughs> it, it was kept short. Cuero quarterback number 12, David Cusack, was a strong leader and handed the ball off to number 33, Frank Wesley, who ran the ball with style and passion. The greatest football player in Cuero history was Frank Wesley. I heard every story that from every practice because my brothers were centers and they would block on him. Cuero rattled off a hard-fought 7-6 win over Kerrville, followed by a 20-7 win over Gatesville, setting the stage for a huge game against top-ranked Gregory Portland. The Wildcats were led by All-State quarterback Marty Akins, who was the son of legendary GP head coach Ray Akins. I met Ray and when I was coaching at Freer, a fine football coach as good as there is in Texas. Gregory Portland, when we played then, we had won the game and we were out on the field celebrating. Some people were even inside the dressing room and we had to play one more play. There'd been a penalty on the play. The last play of the game, they ended up on the eight yard line. Cuero beat Gregory Portland 14 to 10, then shocked undefeated Ennis 12 to six in Austin that sent shockwaves into the Texas high school communities. I think we were 40 points underdogs. underdogs and they were the biggest, hugest team. I walked out on the field, I said, oh, Lord. People read the newspapers, who are these guys? They won on a coin flip. They don't belong on the field with us. Until the game started, they didn't realize what they were up against. And once they got on the field with us, oh. One of our running backs was Robert Beasley. Robert and this uh, Ennis player collided, and Robert got up. Our team was sparked by that up too. You know, these guys were big. I met a man from Ennis that was on that team and he said they'd never been hit so hard so fast. They didn't know what hit them. We were dubbed the Cinderella team. We weren't the biggest and we weren't the fastest, but we played as a team and we were well coached and we were in really good shape. I told you I had no doubts ever we were going to the state championship. One of my biggest moments was just looking out at UT Stadium and seeing us being there and seeing our whole town being in one little section. Texas had just won the national championship. And so just being there, because that was definitely my apex of my athletic career was, was that. The day that we played the night before, a cold front blew through, and it was probably 30 degrees at game time in the gust of 40, 40 to 50 miles an hour. The Gobblers held Gordon Woods' Lions of Brownwood scoreless into the third quarter, but the Lions roared back with two scores to win it 14 to nothing. Had the wind not blown, it had been a good football day. We'd have won that game. Cuero only lost 11 more games during the next nine years under Gilbreth, who was praised by Gordon Wood as the best coach in America after guiding the Gobblers to the state finals in just his second season at Cuero. Coming up next, the early 70s were good to the Gobblers, plus the record-breaking streak is one for the ages. The Cuero ISD Education Foundation is a nonprofit organization that has been making dreams come true since 2002. The mission is to generate and distribute resources to enrich, maintain, and expand CISD programs through scholarships, innovative teaching grants, technology, and building projects. The future is bright in Cuero, where community volunteers are raising money and building endowments to help the CISD Education Foundation lead the way for future generations of gobblers. The Gobblers have had a long, exciting history in Cuero with the legacy of homegrown champions. We have too at Weber Motor Company. Since 1937, when our aunt and grandfather first opened the Ford dealership, we've been developing a legacy of our own. For 78 years, we've been providing Ford cars and trucks equipped the way you want them, at competitive pricing, and all backed by award-winning service to keep the crossroads of Texas moving. Visit us right here in Cuero or at WeberMotorCompany.com and allow us to become a part of your legacy. Welcome back to the Legends of Texas High School Football, the Cuero Gobbler story. We're here at the Pharmacy and Medical Museum located in downtown Cuero. This building was established in 1889. It's been a pharmacy ever since, and most recently now, a museum. It houses a wide variety of pharmaceutical and medical artifacts. The city of Cuero was founded by the railroad that came from Indianola. There are numerous Victorian homes in Cuero that were brought 
here from Indianola after the destructive 1886 major hurricane. DeWitt County was named after Green DeWitt, who was the son of Clinton DeWitt, was the man who introduced the first railroad in America. The Morgan Steamship Company owned the railroad which founded Cuero. The historic pharmacy museum stands out on Main Street. Now let's talk about some standout gobblers from the 1970s. Joel Shepard attended the U.S. Naval Academy after leaving Cuero, but others stayed closer to home. Charlie Arndt went on to play cornerback at Texas A&M. Tim Clark, who played multiple positions at Angelo State, followed by Charles Whitmer, who played offensive tackle at Cuero and later suited up for Texas Tech. Henry Shepard, who would later get drafted by the Cleveland Browns, began a trend of gobblers turned Mustangs playing college football at Southern Methodist University. David Hill later joined the Ponies. Marion Harper Jr. also played at SMU, as did Arthur Whittington. SMU loved Quero players, okay? First of all, we had great talent, we had great pipeline there. Quero defensive end Calvin Blackwell and cornerback Gary Pickens also played at SMU. And A. Lois Blackwell eventually won 1977 MVP honors at the home stadium of SMU in the Cotton Bowl with the Houston Cougars in 1977 before playing in the NFL with the Dallas Cowboys. Arthur Whittington won a Super Bowl ring with the 1980-81 Oakland Raiders. Blackwell and Whittington earned commemorative golden footballs to present to Quero ISD for their participation in past Super Bowls. There's not a whole lot of individuals that play in high school football that can say that they played with two running backs that were in the NFL. The last two seasons, my junior and senior year, we ended up playing Uvalde and we just couldn't get past Uvalde and Uvalde would go on to win the state championship. Well, actually the 72 team might have been the best squirrel team that ever played. You know, Al Lois Blackwell and Arthur Whittington both went on to play professional football. They were the running back. We had a line that could block. After back-to-back -back undefeated regular seasons, the 1973 Quero Gobblers were determined to keep the unbeaten regular season streak alive well into the playoffs. Yeah, Yoakum wasn't in our district at that time, but we opened up against them. And if I'm not mistaken, we were behind like seven to six at halftime, and it wasn't a real good halftime in the locker room, and then the second half, things really kicked in. Cuero shut out nine opponents, including a stretch of only allowing 23 points in the first 13 games. It didn't matter what the offense did. We knew if we got a shutout, we did our job, and Buster wanted shutout. Cuero blank Uvalde 21-0 for the zone championship, which snapped their own two-game skid against the defending champions. We took care of Uvalde two other times. They didn't stand in our way anymore. Quero blank Wharton 7 to nothing, then defeated Gregory Portland 20 to nothing. The pivotal game for us was the Gregory Portland game because they were number one in state at that time. And we went down there as the underdog and we knew we were pretty good. We ran the sixth play, the first play of the game. I knew the first play out of the box. They were soft. We were going to win. Gregory Portland was getting all the press. They were pounding people. They had a quarterback and I think he ended up throwing like four interceptions. Uh, that game. I remember picking off the first one from a tip early on in the game. Maybe a couple of fumble recoveries too. We just shut them down. You've heard the saying defense wins championships. Well, this Quero 1973 team needed their offense to bail them out of trouble in the state semifinals when the Gobblers outscored Henderson 35 to 25 before lining up to play Mount Pleasant in the state championship game. Quero got 122 yards rushing and two touchdowns from Arthur Whittington in that 21-7 win at Floyd Casey Stadium in Waco. What stood out for Jerry Salcher and Tim Clark was their defensive stand to end the game. That's when pride took over. Mount Pleasant had drove the ball to the one-yard line. To the one-yard line. And uh, we were begging him to put, a, put us back in. Just put us back in, Coach. The score was 21-7, and, uh, you know, we didn't like people scoring on us, and so the the, they did make, uh, make a drive down to the one against the second team. You know, coach put the first team back in there and uh, there was one play left and uh, he came right over, right over Tim and I and we just stacked him and he threw Slammed the ball him. down on the ground. He was not happy and we were proud that he didn't score. We didn't like people scoring on us. We were a team destined to win it and I think the way our defense played, if you look at the scores, we had one team score over 13 points. Our team truly laid the foundation of what Quero 44-0 was really all about. First one is to win it from Quero, so yeah, it was, it was something else. You had the whole town backing you and everything. Fortunately, 
in my position, I had great running backs, but once again, it, our offensive line was just so strong. Nathaniel Johnson, we called him Tanny. When we had to grind out three yards and keep the clock running, we gave it to Tanny. He was a workhorse. Played both ways, linebacker and fullback. We always did run the ball more than we passed back in the day. It's three yards and cloud of death. The 1974 season was practically a carbon copy of 73, as Quero only allowed 12 points in the first 11 games. Once again, a 21-0 win over Uvalde earned the zone championship and set the stage for a couple of titanic playoff games. First up, Brazosport, who were equal to the task of snapping Quero's 26-game winning streak. The exporters were tough, but the Gobblers were just a bit tougher and perhaps luckier as they won it 14-13 in the opening round of the state playoffs. Brazosport was an extraordinarily good team. Uh, they, they ran, as I recall, a wishbone tee and they ran it very well and it was something that we had not faced before. Uh, I feel like Brazosport was just a really phenomenal team that we were fortunate to beat. Next up, a familiar foe, the Gregory Portland Wildcats, again this time at Memorial Stadium in Victoria. Ray Akins and his bunch from the Coastal Bend thought this would be the year to end the Quero curse. But a 19 to 13 win by the Gobblers settled that score. You know that when we played GP and, and it was, you know, back to back, we played Brazosport. Those two games, you if you saw those games, you saw football games. But to impress upon you how important the winning streak was, Coach Gear was sent in a to kneel the ball, which any logical person would do. <laughs> kneel the ball and you advance the next round. In the playoffs back then, there were no overtimes. There were penetrations, then, then if that first was tied, you go to first downs. Yeah. We all got together and said, no, we're not kneeling the ball. We changed the play to our off tackle running play, and we scored. And of course, none of us wanted to go to the sideline and face Coach Gilbert after we did that, because we knew he was gonna you know, get on us. He said, but if you ever change my play again when I call you in, he said, you won't be playing for me anymore. Jacksonville was a tough opponent as well in the state semifinals. The Gobblers won it 31 to 21, setting the stage for another perfect season. Everybody has to be on the same page. Everybody knows what he's doing. I know what I'm supposed to do. I know what he's going to do. I know what he needs to do. He knows what I need to do. It's all team. It's teamwork. Next up, the Gainesville Leopards. They had a saying that started out once more in 74. Plan was to win state. Put it together and made that work, which then became keep it alive in 75. The second championship my senior year obviously was sweeter because it put us on a dynasty map. It was a true team effort all the way through. It was a great experience. The Gobblers won 19 to seven over Gainesville to make it two state titles in a row, outscoring their opponents 459 to 66. It was overwhelming, you know, uh, and like I said, come back the next year and do it again back to back, it's, it's awesome, man, I mean. Like you say, you have to be there to, to understand how the field really is. The second one with Gainesville game, when we came in and we won 30 in a row and we knew that that was history, we came in and Coach had Cokes up to drink, we just took all the Cokes and we were just shooting it on everybody. And he yeah, was shooting it. That was the happiest day of our lives. I was looking for the champagne. Coming up next, the record-breaking streak is one for the ages. Visit downtown Quero on Main Street, the center of entertainment, shopping, dining, and more. Christmas in downtown, the second weekend of December in Quero. A giant 30-foot Christmas tree overlooks an artificial ice skating rink with a snow globe and antique carousel, all in view from Santa's workshop. Stroll past arts and crafts vendors from a Christmas train or just take in some outstanding performances. Visit QueroMainStreet.com and follow us on Facebook. Quero is recognized as a scenic city by the state of Texas with its historical charm. The wildflower capital of the Lone Star State is blooming with excitement. From the DeWitt County Historical Museum to the beautifully designed courthouse, all roads lead to Quero. Royce Drugs is the oldest pharmacy in Texas and it has a museum to prove it. Did you know Quero is the turkey capital of the world? The birds are on the ground. Whether it's Ruby Begonia running wild in October or fireworks in the park in July, Quero, where winning is a way of life. The more you win, the more pressure it is to win. Welcome back to the legends of Texas high school football, the Quero Gobblers story. Just outside of the VFW here in Quero, where the football team gets a chance to mingle with the fans and get some barbecue chicken on top of that, it's an opportunity to meet the Gobblers. This is what we call our kickoff banquet. 30-something years we've been doing this. When we started the, the Booster Club, the first guy that started it was a 
was a guy named Joe Shepard that had the idea in 1970. I'm Mary Shepard. Okay. I'm a 1976 graduate of Quarrel High School. My brother, Joe Shepard, played on the 1970 team. My first cousin, Henry Shepard, also played on the 1970 team. That was the beginning of what I'd consider the era. Coach Gilbreth arrived and it was magic. You know, we had giant pep rallies at the school. The cheerleaders would jump up and down and the band would be playing and you know, we were all sitting out in front of everybody and it, it was really nice. When you get the whole crowd going, it blows over to the other side and it just freaks those people out. Barbecue, before it ever started uh, the season, back during the gas shortage that we had, uh, told the people as we left, now be sure, top your car out all during the week because we don't know how far the games are going to be this next week to play off, and you must have gas to get there. If you factor in a 15-game schedule, the 1975 Quero Gobblers defense allowed the fewest points of all of the Quero teams in the early 1970s. Now, defensively, throughout all of those wins, our regular huddle said, regular, regular, ready break. <laughs> we didn't stunt. Yeah. One iota. If you miss an assignment of any kind, you know, there really wasn't an excuse for it because it was the same old thing over and over and over. Same plays for, for every year, so it was easy to learn to play, that's for sure. Three yards and a cloud of dust, and I told him, Coach, this fourth and one is getting old. <laughs> the Gobbler's toughest test during the regular season might have come against rival Gonzalez. Every week was a rivalry to some level. Every one of those towns was anxious to beat us. And so we knew every week we had to be ready, same as any other team or any other sport. We gave up 13 points against Gonzalez, our first district ball game. It was 18 to 13 at the half, and they had a very good team. They had a big fullback named Leonard Arnick. And we're coming back with only five offensive, two defensive starters back. We made it through the first five ball games. We've, we've got a 35 game winning streak going. Come out the second half, they don't score. The next four district ball games, nobody scores. A 61 to nothing win over Southside set the stage for another shutout of Uvalde for the third consecutive season. The Gobblers beat West Columbia 14 to two in a game that featured a stout defensive performance by Cuero. The toughest test in the postseason was once again Gregory Portland, but the Gobblers stood tall in a 9-3 win, then followed that up with a 14 to nothing victory over Jacksonville. There's eight and a half ball games right there. We haven't given up a touchdown. And I remember going into that. It was a national thing. State record for the points, fewest points given up and all of that. Next up, the Ennis Lions once again in a rematch of the 1970 state semifinals. We kick off to them, they run a reverse and score on us. That seemed to catch the Gobblers off guard at Kyle Field in College Station. Cuero settled in and scored the next 10 points to take a 10-6 lead. It appeared the Gobblers' good fortunes would continue when they recovered a fumble by Mark Gant near midfield. But Cuero gave the ball right back on a fumble, allowing the Lions new life. We had the ball. They fumbled. And we fumbled it right back to them. We blew our break when we fumbled the snap because there wasn't but three or four minutes left in the ball game. All we had to do was run the clock and they weren't moving the ball. Cuero appeared to stop in us on a couple of occasions, but penalties ultimately cost Cuero and the man who fumbled earlier, Mark Gant, would score the game-winning touchdown in the corner of the end zone. When they got the ball back, it was just penalty after another. Every play, every yeah, play. Yeah. It went all the way till they got to the goal line, and that would kill us right there. We got a penalty. In the next play, we get a penalty because we are over aggressive. Then from that time on, they moved the ball right down our throat. We just made too many mistakes. The breaks didn't go our way exactly, and my arm was still hurting, you know, and, and we were out of time, no timeouts. Basically, all we could do is those sideline patterns, and I just, I couldn't connect on them, so it broke my heart. Ennis held Cuero in check near midfield, and the winning streak had come to an end with a 13 to 10 victory by Ennis. You're awful empty, I was, and, but the first thing I had to do is I had to get to the dressing room and talk to my kids. Ennis was state champs in class 3A, and Cuero found out what the other side felt like for 44 previous games. How many teams that you sent to the dressing room feeling exactly how you feel right now. 
and it helped a little bit, but it didn't help much, but it helped a little bit, but it made me feel good to be able to say it. And it really, the chicken fried steaks that night didn't taste quite well, and they didn't eat very much, and they, they just, they took it hard. I remember after the game was over, just being almost in a state of shock, because I don't think the thought of losing ever crossed any of our minds. When people talk about the state championship, oh, you had a chance to win three in a row. No, what disappointed us was the 45. Well, now, sure, we would have had the championship with it. Like Buster Gilbreth, another legendary coach from Smiley was Jim Streety, who recorded 343 victories, including an upset of Cuero while coaching in New Braunfels in 1976. That victory by the Unicorns ended a 25-year playoff drought and kept Cuero from reaching their fourth straight state title game. They came to New Braunfels in the ninth game of the season and uh, we were able to beat them and uh, make the playoffs for the first time since uh, 1951. We've kept up with each other, been great friends. Our families obviously know each other as he lives in San Antonio. Jim Streety, well, you know he's one of the best coaches in Texas. Gilbert, like Streety, is in the Texas Sports Hall of Fame in Waco and the Texas High School Coaches Association Hall of Honor in San Marcos. Buster served in the Korean War and has been married to his wife, Frances, for nearly 60 years. When you start it, you finish it. The Smiley native coached the Gobblers from 1969 through 79. He compiled a 107 and 22 record with just three ties. He also recorded nine playoff appearances in his 11 seasons at a time when only one team from each district advanced to postseason play. Gilbert led Cuero to four state final appearances and two state championships. The Gobblers won 44 consecutive games, 26 of them by shutout from 1973 to 75, which is still in the top five longest winning streaks in Texas history. Cuero hadn't won much of anything before Buster got there. But Buster felt it every year because you'd go down to the coffee shop before season started and people would ask who you're going to play in the semifinals, not who's going to be tough in district. It was expected to win here. We're 63 one and one over a period from 71 through 75. That gives your kids a lot of confidence. Coming up, a new era in Gobbler's history. We never talked about breaking records. You know, we talked about winning the next game. When the legends of Texas high school football, the Quero Gobbler story continues. Quero has only one hometown football team and one original hometown bank, Trust Texas Bank. Since 1921, we've been building relationships based on trust and service across generations. Go Mean Green. With a commitment to excellence, Trust Texas Bank supports the local community through financial services and volunteering. Go Mean Green. Trust Texas Bank is your friendly hometown bank with its headquarters in Quero, where history, heritage, and hospitality go hand in hand. Trust Texas Bank. Go Mean Green. Need hardware or perhaps a historic Texas treasure? Wagner's Hardware and Gifts is located in the heart of Quero's historic Main Street District. Since its construction in 1891, this continuously operated hardware store was purchased by the Wagner family in 1945 and is celebrating its 70th anniversary. The Wagners are passionate about keeping the ambiance of the 1800s. Wagner's Hardware, where the past meets the present. Call us at 361-275-5134. Welcome back to the legends of Texas high school football, the Quero Gobbler story. I'm Jeff Power. Well, the 1980s were very successful for Quero. In fact, they made three championship runs. The third was the charm. New Quero head football coach Larry Pullen had big shoes to fill, replacing William Buster Gilbreth, who accepted a head coaching job in Pasadena. Larry knew he had to be himself and trust his instincts. The Gobblers had the talent, and by 1985, were knocking on the door of another state title. Everybody that I knew, all the guys, they, they played their heart out, every one of them. I mean, it was like your brother and your, your son, you know, and your, you, know, that's, you were playing for them. What stood in Cuero's way was the Van Vleck Leopards at Memorial Stadium in Austin. The Gobblers raced out to a 35 to 14 lead, only to see it dissipate to a 36-35 deficit as Van Vleck quarterback Robert Blackman was up for the challenge. We probably got complacent thinking that we had the game won uh, there in the second half and, and they made some big plays. They had some tremendous athletes. They ran a sweep to Robert and he broke the line and went 90-something yards for a touchdown. And I remember it well because while I was 40 yards behind him, I was running all the way behind him very excited about it. 
turned back and there was a yellow flag on the, on the ground and they called it for all sides. And we've gone back and looked at that play yeah. and it, nobody was all sides. We start over again, we're driving down the field. You know, Robert fumbles yeah. and uh, we, we thought he was down. Mm -hmm. they, they called him down and we kept running a little bit further. Brad Gable was the gobbler quarterback and the future Baylor Bear was having a great season, but he would need to lead his team into field goal range if they were to pull the upset and continue their state title run. A series of, of quick passes to the Taylor brothers outside. We just marched it down. Brad Gable was an awesome quarterback. I think he broke, you know, numerous records that year. We just didn't think we had time to get it all the way in. And we weren't going to throw it deep against uh, those defensive backs that they had. The Gobblers lined up for the game-winning field goal as Larry's son, Clay Pullen, was up for the challenge, splitting the uprights, sending Cuero to the state title game with a 38-36 victory. Everything was perfect. I mean, the snap was good, the hold was good, um, and, and then, of course, I caught the, the ball good. But then there was a flag on the play, and, and I'm thinking, oh, man, that's against us. Well, luckily, it was uh, offsides on Van Vleck and the field goal counted. Clay Pullen wasn't going to miss that field goal because he had been automatic all those times I'd played with him all the through seventh grade. Probably that was our state championship game. You know, Van Vleck was ranked number one the whole year. We, uh, we were kind of the underdog, but uh, we came out on top of that game. And then obviously the next week we went up to uh, Baylor Stadium and, and took on a, uh, a Dangerfield team that was uh, very good and probably uh, Emotionally, we were spent from the week before. The Gobblers' season finale against Dangerfield did not end as planned as the Gobblers fell 47-22. to It was unlike our Quarrel teams to have a lot of turnovers. Dangerfield could have been the pro cause of that. But we did have, uh, you know, about five interceptions and I think three fumbles or something like that. And, and when you do that against a good football team in any level of, of the game, you're not going to be able to beat, uh, win the game. Larry Pullen had a very successful six-year run at Cuero, which ended after that 1985 season when he took the job at Abilene High School. Got the program going and got back in the playoffs and, and, and had everybody, boy, the, the excitement in the community just goes, you know, it's just like a wildfire. Pat Blessing was already on the coaching staff and he was the next man up and was hired to replace Pullen in 1986. I can't say that I didn't do anything but inherit great tradition and good players and, and kids that knew how to win. I guess the players coach, they were really in tune with us. They uh, took care of us and they uh, treated us like their own kids. That was pretty good there. Blessing's first team scored 526 points and were really battle tested in the Hondo game which Quero won 18 to 15. Convincing wins over Sherryland, Hebronville, and Port Arthur Austin put the Gobblers in the championship game. We created this atmosphere of just confidence that we had. We knew we had massive talent, and uh, we knew we had great leadership. We knew we had good coaching. It was just a matter of us just going out there and executing. The quarterback is a leader. There's a lot of responsibility associated with being the quarterback, but. I welcomed the challenge and I was pretty excited about it. Actually, we had the Oklahoma coach come through one time. Jamel Holloway was the quarterback at the time there. He, he thought that our quarterback, Wayne Mathis, was a better option quarterback than him. The triple option, he was good at reading it and you know we had to keep him for our quarterback. He was, we needed him to lead our team. He was a real good leader too. Jefferson handed Cuero their first loss of the season, 24 to nothing in the state title game at Kyle Field in College Station. The loss gave the Gobblers the desire to take it one step further in 1987 behind standout players Robert Strait, who had 2,089 yards rushing, plus quarterback Wayne Mathis and his 1,633 yards passing. You throw in Rodney Pedraza, who had over 200 tackles, and Adam Arroyo, who was the lineman of the year, and you had the nucleus of Cuero's third state championship season hanging in the balance. There was a feeling because they had been to the state final two times previous and lost in the state final. So there was definitely a feeling that this was the year it had to be. The guys from the played a, a lot in 85 and everybody started in 86 and we were back at it at 87. We just had a few people we had to replace and so it was like we didn't miss a beat. And we knew once we started that year, they said, well, we got a chance again this year. We had a little bit of a swagger. I mean, we were pretty good. We were kind of like the, the Miami Hurricanes of, the, of, the, of high school football. I mean, we, we did a lot of high-fiving and, and jumping around. And, you know, we knew we were good. We told you we were good. We told you what we were going to do. And so there was a lot of swagger. 
Robert Strait had a monster year in 1987, rushing for 3,515 yards, scoring 54 touchdowns. Running backs, you know, and linebackers usually collide. But when you have a great offensive line, you know, Adam Arroyo, Kirk Loggy, Henry Flores, those guys, and then your fullback takes out that linebacker, and the first person you see is usually a safety or a small cornerback. I mean, it makes the job so much easier. Well, I just come in and wherever, whatever play we had, I couldn't wait to hit that guy. And all you had to do was give just a little crease for Robert, and he was going to make something out of it. You know, people talk about, you know, the yards I got and all that, but I mean, without those guys, it, you know, it would have been just average. A hard-fought 33-14 win over LaGrange, followed by another strong opponent, Cameron Yo, 34-27, battle-tested Cuero for a 14-6 victory over McGregor in the state title game. We wanted to go home 16 and know it was uh, probably the most fired up I had been my whole football career before that game. There was no doubt in our mind going to the ball game we were going to win it, but we remembered the year before, we're not going to lose the game. That was a different approach than we had taken in the ball game. So that might have been some of the. I know Coach Blessing used to always have a saying, half a hundred and have some fun. Relax a little bit and let second team, third team in. Uh, everybody get some time to play and, and we, we, enjoyed, uh, we enjoyed those games. I think the coaching staff did a tremendous job in allowing us to just be us. You know, this is a group of guys that have been together since kindergarten. You know, third time's a charm. We just knew what we had to do. I, I felt like the coach's job was rather easy with us. We had a special bond amongst all of us. Going into our senior year, there was a, a feeling of we had some unfinished business to take care of. Cuero's offense tallied up 705 points, but it was their defense that also stood strong as Cuero earned their third state title, which was one for the record books. Yeah, it was special to actually win it that year. And to say, oh boy, finally. <laughs> There is some pressure to live up to the past. There is some pressure to live up to the tradition. They want to get their names up on that big sign up on the high school. When Pat got the job, we were talking about, you know, he needed to keep improving to keep his job. Larry was 14 and two. So, you know, the next year we were 15 and one and the next year we were 16 and 0. Just as SMU was a huge connection for Cuero, so was Baylor. What began with lineman Thomas Nolan Bluntser from the class of 1970 at Cuero to Joe Campbell, who was a place kicker for the Gobblers and also a lineman in the mid 1970s. He played on the Baylor defensive line along with linebacker Mike Singletary in 1980. Former Baylor Bear head coach Grant Taft spoke regularly in Cuero at the All-Star Banquet and continued his success with the Gobblers, recruiting Brad Gable, who played in the NFL for Philadelphia, Cleveland, and Jacksonville, plus Trooper Taylor, Robert Strait, and Adam Arroyo, who also played for the Baylor Bears. Rodney Pedraza, whose father was a QB for the 1961 state champion Donna Redskins, chose baseball along with Jason Gonzalez for the Texas Longhorns. Pedraza played eight years of professional ball with Montreal, Colorado, and eventually Texas, plus had a five-year stint in Japan when he played in four All-Star games. Wayne Mathis was drafted by the New York Mets and has been a professional scout for 15 years, currently scouting for the Pittsburgh Pirates. The Mickey Finley era is next when the legends of Texas high school football, the Quero Gobbler story continues. What began in 1912 with thousands of turkeys being herded down the city streets of Cuero to the fall market is now a present day celebration of the rich turkey heritage known as Cuero Turkey Fest. Complete with a parade, entertainment and dancing, the second weekend of October has been home to the Great Gobbler Gallop Turkey Race. Cuero's Ruby Begonia and rival Paycheck of Worthington, Minnesota sprint to the finish line in both towns who claim to be the turkey capital of the world. For more on this historic event, visit turkeyfest.org. Founded in 2002, Quero's Weaver & Jacobs Constructors provides superior construction solutions with the highest level of service, professional advice, and meticulous detail on every project. The $28 million fine arts, gymnasium, and fieldhouse construction overlooks the Gobbler Stadium renovations. Seven other school district bond programs totaling over $200 million are currently being built by Weaver & Jacob Constructors in the South Texas area. Let us help you out at weaverandjacobs.com. Welcome back to the Legends of Texas High School Football, the Cuero Gobbler story. I'm here at Cuero High School, where in the 1990s, Mickey Finley took over this program, and what a great job he did. He brought his son, Clint, with him, who could do a little bit of everything. 
1992 was certainly a bad first impression for Coach Finley, but the 93 Quero Gobblers overachieved thanks in part to great coaching by Finley, who like Buster Gilbreth 23 years earlier, instilled an off-season workout program known as the House of Pain. When Coach Finley came in in, uh, in the spring, he put us in the, what we called the House of Pain and got us in shape right away. and. Uh, it taught us a lot of discipline, it made us better football players, but it also uh, helped us understand the game and understand how important it was for us to, to be in shape. It got you right, you know, it got your, your, your heart right, you know, and uh, it just made you a better person. For a new coach coming in, you know, it really roots out the guys. Obviously, that's not easy to do. And there's a lot of, I mean, just the name House of Pain and what you've heard today, uh, it was a lot of hard work. Well, we came in with the House of Pain, so we, we were we were some of the initiated ones, um, and it's it's every bit of what you've heard, <laughs> and then some. You know, the whole House of Pain theory was something that, uh, it was very hot, it was an old gym that we worked out in, and uh, it was tough, I'm telling you. I, we had uh, buckets everywhere, and you know, if you if you got sick, you go visit those buckets, but don't miss your turn on the ropes or whatever we're doing. The calluses that I built up on my hands were already ripped off and bleeding, and. It was getting you your mindset to the point of I can do this, and you know, regardless of what happens in front of me, I can push through it. They would put you through things you didn't think you could do, and that would get you to the points where you knew, regardless of who lined up in front of you, I knew I could beat that person. The off season that year was just very strenuous. Uh, the house of pain, I feel like made a man out of a bunch of young men. If it was easy, everybody would be, you know, successful and. Uh, Dad always made the best decision for the football team, whether it be personnel or anything else. The good coaches, they had their systems, but they adjust to their personnel too. Clint Finley played multiple positions at Quero and would later play quarterback for Nebraska and the Kansas City Chiefs in the NFL. He was a born leader, especially at the QB position for the Gobblers. You know, growing up the coach's son, uh, you know, I always knew the offense pretty in depth. It was just one of those deals that fit nicely just to make the transition from wherever they needed me to quarterback as a sophomore. That's why I kind of let the coaches handle him as far as his playing time because I, I didn't want to add pressure. Being a coach's son, being a sophomore, being the quarterback for Quero Gobblers was plenty of pressure without me adding to it at home. Uh, he always was a little harder on me. He expected a lot from me. He wanted me to be at the front, doing it the way he expected it to be done and setting an example. We had a great bunch of leaders. Uh, Chris Mathis, Rome McNary, Brad Sly. All those guys are the ones that got it started. Quero certainly had a lot of talent in 1993. Matt Anderson and LeVar Jenkins went on to play for the University of Texas, while Wesley Kubish played at Rice. Linebacker and tight end Don Arroyo kept the Baylor connection going from Cuero even after Coach Taff had left. Melvin Barnett, who went to Baylor as well, was an outstanding Cuero player, rushing for 3,738 yards and 92 TDs for his career. Plus, Kevin Palmer went from being a gobbler to a cowboy from the University of Wyoming. There was a wall that had pictures of all the guys that had played in college and the NFL, and you know you saw that every day as you came in and out of the locker room, and you were striving to be one of those guys as well. We were a, a pretty young team still, and, and still trying to to find uh, our identity. We had just lost to Sweeney on a, on a Hail Mary uh, to put us at two and two. So I, I just remember thinking that that just didn't feel right, that we were a lot better than a two and two team. We went on a nice little run for the rest of that season. Mickey's son Clint helped Quero defeat Edna before stopping Marble Falls in a defensive struggle 14 to six. That game was built up so big. You know, we went out and performed and it was a gut-wrenching battle from the beginning to the end and luckily we came out on top and uh, I think that might be the the one. <laughs> Marble Falls actually I think they were undefeated at the time but that was kind of the moment when we knew we were going to go on a good run because we were the underdogs in that game and coming in nobody gave us a chance and uh, it was a slugfest and we were able to come out on top and at that point we knew that we were we were going to be for real that year. Following wins over Port Isabel and Lampasas, Quero reached the state semifinals in familiar territory at the University of Texas. Finley had a key 54-yard touchdown run and a 32-0 win over Columbus 
that sent Cuero to the state finals for the third straight decade. They're very, very talented. You know, the Shoba boys, great football players. And, you know, they got a great tradition. They had a really good coach and Coach Bluta. They were coached very well. They were physical and uh, they were talented. Talk about state championships, everybody talks about Carroll, and those are things that they have that we want. Before the season, actually, Coach Finley, during two days, gave us a speech, and he told us that at the end of the year, we're going to play South Lake Carroll for the state championship game. And, you know, at that time, like I said, we're coming off of a couple of losing seasons, not making the playoffs, so we're kind of like, okay, well, well, we'll see what happens. But just to have that come to be was just awesome. Defending Class 3A state champion South Lake Carroll handed Cuero a hard-fought loss in Waco as the Dragons won their third of eight eventual state championships. South Lake Carroll, that was their last year of 3A, and they had won a couple, maybe two or three in a row at that point, and that game was, was awesome. It, it was another slugfest. Um, I think we got up on them 6 nothing, and that was the first time at halftime that they had not been leading the whole season. Early in the third quarter, they came out and had put together two scoring drives. Um, and then, you know, that was, that was the end of the game, 14-6. We were probably the only guys in America that thought we could get to the state championship football game. They built the team around defense. And then the offense was, you know, the number of athletes that Cuero had was a, a big thing that helped us out. I don't believe that, from my standpoint, that everybody expected the 93 team to go to the state finals. I mean, I think it just... It happened, and then from that standpoint, it just continued to grow, and the, the expectation came back. Reaching the state finals in 93 might have been a great season, but Cuero was undefeated in 1994 until they faced Port Isabel in the regional semifinals down in Kingsville. The Tarpons were a team Cuero beat by 55 points the year before, but not this time around. Uh, the stadium was full, I remember. Their side was... It was packed. It was a packed house, and. I think they realized right away that this was going to be a battle. We kind of thought it was going to be business as usual, and that just goes to show you they kind of jumped up and bit us, and they had no, no business doing that. But, you know, at the end of the day, uh, back then there was no uh, overtime, so they tied us 20 to 20, and they won on penetrations, and, and that was it. It was, it was over. The Gobblers won at least 11 games in five of the next six seasons, which included a state semifinal appearance in 1995. Well, 95 was a great season, too. I mean, we got beat 17-14 by Sealy in the semifinals, and it was a game, same thing, that could have gone either way. And, you know, you basically lose to the state champions in 93. Uh, you lose to them again in 95. You lose to them again in 96. You lose to them again in 97. Just can't quite get over the hump. Floodwaters displaced players and coaches up and down the hill country throughout South Central Texas. When the legends of Texas high school football, the Quero Gobbler story continues. When in Quero, stay at Best Western with close to 80 rooms, a swimming pool, free Wi-Fi, full hot breakfast. Stay with people who care. Best Western in Quero. PBK Sports is a multidiscipline group of architects and engineers that specialize in providing expert programming, design, and construction administration services specifically for sports facilities. Our clients include universities, public and private schools, and recreational groups throughout Texas. At PBK Sports, we create inspiring environments that enhance athletic performance and spectator experience. We believe in truly listening to clients and responding to their needs. PBK, designing for champions. Partnership. Chevrolet and Quero has been the people's trusted source for honest low prices with no pressure. You don't have to go it alone because at Partner Chevy Buick GMC and Quero, you have a partner in the car business. That's Partner Chevrolet. Welcome back to the Legends of Texas High School Football, the Quero Gobbler story. The Mickey Finley era took place in the 1990s here in Quero. What a great time it was, but fittingly, rain was a big subject for this team, especially in 1998. Hopes of another state finals run in 1998 got off to a slow start, thanks in part to the Gobbler's opponents, but soon Mother Nature would be the toughest foe for Cuero. The Guadalupe became a raging river, damaging or destroying more than 40% of the city's housing in the middle of that 98 season. A lot of people, a lot of players lost their home, a lot of, a lot of coaches also. I had waste high water in my house, okay? So I could relate to some of the kids and everything. They actually stopped by my house and told me that, you know, you need to get out, the flood's coming. And I looked outside and was like, I ain't no flood coming, you know. 20 minutes later, water was coming up on the porch. 
I mean, we have to just get everything and bail. You know, that was a 500 year floodplain. And I mean, almost the entire town of Quero was gone. It was devastated. If your teammate doesn't have a home or he needs some help moving something, go help. Or maybe a family member of them, you know. The flood affected physically over a fourth of our community. Uh, homes lost. The water was extremely high. My house had 12 foot of water in it. I remember telling my dad, and you know, I want to go find some of my teammates, some of my buddies. I feel comfortable being around them. And we went and helped out some other coaches that were, you know, still trying to get out of the water. You could just sit there and actually see the water rising. And uh, we got concerned about a couple of our coaches that lived over there, Coach Buzzard. By the time we got him loaded up, there was probably six, eight inches of water in his house. And uh, we barely got out of there. And then his house was completely submerged in water before the end of the day. Asking my dad, you know, I was 15 years old, 16 years old, hey, what's going to happen? I don't know. You know, that's the first time I've ever had my parent tell me I have no idea what, what's going to be next. And, um, you know, it didn't matter how much money you had or how much money you didn't have, we didn't have anything. And we were all in it together at the Red Cross shelter. We all came together as one unit and we helped each other out. I mean, it was just. The turnaround right there was awesome. Even Luling head coach Phil Grangine, who lived in Quero at the time, had to act fast during the turmoil. About 20 inches that pounded New Braunfels within about an hour to an hour and a half, which brought the flood all the way into Luling. By the time I got into Luling, I found out that many of my coaches and many of my players' houses had flooded. My entire neighborhood went under. We spent the next three days doing nothing but helping Queroites clean their homes. Phil Grangine was the coach over there. And he was actually helping me get my coaches out, which is a pretty unique story in itself. The Gobblers, who had lost two of their first three games that season, were forced to play Luling on a Monday night following the flood. The result, complete domination by Quero. The Monday night football song coming on, and we played in Quero. We had the Monday night football. game, the song yeah. on. That did it for yeah. me. Right yeah, oh yeah. And it was a, I think it was a good time for the town and, and such a, you know, hard time. It seemed like it brought the whole community together and by everybody getting behind us it just gave us that hype that we needed to just come together as a team and play hard. I really felt like you know with all the devastation going on that took place in Quero we had a chance to maybe do something and that was not the case. That was an incredible football team it's an incredible year. And I think that flood brought that out to the kids to the family and to the community. There is nothing to be taken for granted and they played with their whole heart, they played with everything that they had, and I think Mickey and their coaching staff at that time had done a wonderful job with them. You know, we're part of the town, and there were people hurting, and uh, and I was talking to some of the players, and it was just a good escape for us to get lost in those football games. When our starting quarterback, Marcus McDonald, broke his arm, Andrew stepped in, and man, we didn't miss a beat. We lost our starting quarterback, but we had a a sophomore step up and take us, and Andrew Hurd was the one that came and stepped in. My best friend, Andrew Hurd, we were the same age, he was a quarterback, and so I'd actually gone in on the play where we scored the touchdown. I pull out there, there's one guy to block, I block him, Andrew scores, it was the best day of my life right there. Cuero got on a roll in the postseason and were 10-3 and three heading into a state final showdown with Alito. The Bearcats won their first of six eventual state titles. We were in the five yard line like three times in the first half and we didn't score. Their defense was good. They were real good. Last kickoff, I think I had a 45 yard kickoff return and then the next play was a 35 yard play. So we're down there like on the 20. I mean, it's just, we ran out of time is what had happened. We were getting there, we just, we just didn't get it done. Look at how Alito started and now they're what, 5A. Look at South Lake Carroll, you know, what, now they're 6A. Look at Quero and Refugio. Nothing's changed. Nothing's changed. <laughs> you know? Mickey Finley compiled a 69, 23, and two record in seven seasons as the Gobblers head coach, leading Cuero to the class 3A state finals twice, being named the Texas Football Magazine Coach of the Year in 1998. Mickey's father played for Gordon Wood at Spur High School, and some 60 years later, Mickey and the Cuero Gobblers would win the Gordon Wood Award recognizing a team that displayed good sportsmanship while overcoming challenges with the support of the community and of course success on the field. Kids deserve that award very much. They, they persevered through more than, than most teams ever thought about. 
The coaching staff was tremendous. Nearly every one of those guys became very successful head coaches later on. Because we, we were team of the year and everything we overcame, we were issued these rings here. So that was something we were all pretty proud of right after that. I know I'm pretty sure we wore it everywhere, especially when we went to dance halls out of town. Oh, yeah. I know I always had mine out. And proud of the quarterback on that 1998 Cuero football team was sophomore Andrew Hurd, who would later have to overcome more than just opposing defenses. By his senior year, Andrew broke his ankle during the Edna game, and while being examined, doctors discovered he had fourth stage Hodgkin's lymphoma with a grapefruit-sized tumor in his chest. Never one to give up, Hurd was a redshirt freshman beginning at Texas Tech, but a calling into ministry brought Hurd to Baylor where he walked on and lettered as a receiver. Hurd won a state football title at Liberty Christian High School as a coach and later ministered in Dallas, but the cancer spread to his lungs and he died in 2013. He led our devotionals uh, for our football team on game day when he would just, could just barely stagger in there because he just got done with a chemotherapy uh, session. And uh, I would try to tell him, Andrew, you know, uh, we understand. He said, no, I want to be here for these kids. Uh, he impacted uh, not only our kids, but our entire community. Hurd's memory lives on as an inspiration for others about how to live each day to the fullest. The father-son combination of the Reeve family is next when the Legends of Texas High School Football continues. Our silver level sponsors include State Farm. When in Quero, contact Brian Gomez at 361-275-9193. Nesquik, a healthy beverage that kids of all ages love to drink. The Pecan House in Quero. For all your pecan specialties, gift boxes, gourmet foods, or gifts that are just plain nutty. The venue where South Texas meets New Orleans style. With over 10,000 square feet of event space for weddings, reunions, banquets, or meetings in charming downtown Quero. Every used car, $49 down and pay the payment on the window. Quero Dodge is selling every used car or truck for just $49 down and pay the payment on the window plus TT&L. You want a truck? Rams, Silverados, F-150s, $49 down. Optimas, Impalas, Toyota Camry, $49 down and $189 a month. Take advantage of 0% for 75 months financing on certain Ram 1500s. See your dealer for details, QueroDodge.com. In 2004, the Cuero Gobblers played in their last state championship game. They took on the Abilene Wiley Bulldogs, who were led by Case Keenum, who would later go on to play for the University of Houston and in the NFL with the Houston Texans. It was a great game that went down to the wire. In fact, it came down to a field goal. Matt Schumacher quarterbacked the Gobblers to a perfect regular season as they shut out five opponents, though they won another game 56-55. They were led by first-team All-Staters Roy Sierra and Casey Harriman, plus 20 all district selections. I was the leader on defense. Um, of course, the play came into me. I had to call it and everything like that. It was definitely tough sometimes. He got me in the right place uh, to call the right defense and stuff on the field. There's a lot of hatred in our district. I mean, <laughs> between Gonzalez and Yoakum, it's definitely was our first goal to get out there and I think take care of the, the people that live around us. If you go to a town and they don't have high expectations, those are the hardest places there are to win. The good thing about Quero, it didn't matter if they were five and five or 15 and zero; oh, they had very high expectations. We could tell we had something special in Coach Reed. We all we all bought in immediately to what he was what he was preaching and. We knew we were, we were going to have something special. Schumacher followed in his father's footsteps in leading the Gobblers deep into December, thanks in part to one of the best offensive lines in the state. We had some really good offensive linemen. Uh, and, you know, any time that you've got good leadership, uh, I think that ends up carrying over. A rather large offensive line that was known as the Mule Crew. They like to make the jokes. There's a picture of us all standing right before, the, right before breaking the, the huddle. You know, I'm in the very center, you got all the guys around us, it just kind of makes them vegan. They'd make a big joke, oh, well, the guy in the center six foot two, if it tells you how big these guys really are. <laughs> that was the key to the team, for sure. They made, they made my job a lot easier, I know that. He knew when to make his adjustments when he had to, and the good thing is we all had our wristbands on to be able to tell, you know, what number he called. We can glance at it real quick while we're in our stance. Made it real easy. I scored a 60-yard touchdown. 
and I spun the ball and I shouldn't have and I was excited. I mean, I just, you know, juke 12 people and there's only 11 on the field. I come off to the sideline and he's yelling at me for like 20 yards, just getting on me. I said, all right, coach, I won't do it again. Halftime, gets on me again about the same play. We win the game, gets on me again about the same play. I'm like, coach, I got it. I think, I think we, I won't do it again, I promise. <laughs> it's okay, but after that he was like, all right, I'm glad you understand. In the playoffs, Cuero beat West Columbia and 2005 future state champion Wimberley in the first two rounds. That Wimberley game sticks out in my mind for sure. It was just a nasty atmosphere. There was, it was heavy, heavy fog. You couldn't even see the top of the stands at each other the whole game. Nobody could really get in a good groove, and they were a great football team. Definitely a, a game that kind of defined us as a team. Kyle Nowak picked up a fumble late in the fourth quarter and ran it in. That was the difference in the ball game. That was the last Texans loss for almost two years and sent Cuero to a quarterfinal matchup with rival Sinton at the Alamo Dome. The regular season matchup was decided by a touchdown, but the rematch was over by halftime. Schumacher only completed seven passes in the game, but two were for touchdowns. The Gobbler defense forced three Pirate turnovers and pitched a shutout in a 31-0 win over Sinton. I think everybody just kind of bought into the system had a, a year under our belts. In the semifinals, Quero matched up with Palestine in Round Rock. The defense scored as many touchdowns as it allowed thanks to a pair of pick sixes. Schumacher's 16-yard touchdown pass to Rudd sealed a 27-17 win and the Gobbler's 10th state final appearance. I dreamed of playing for a state championship my whole, you know, growing up. Gobbler Nation was ready for the state final against Abilene Wiley, and after a scoreless first quarter, an interception put Cuero on the Bulldogs' six. Schumacher kept it himself and ran right into the end zone for the first points of the game. The PAT failed, which allowed Wiley to take a 7-6 lead at halftime after Keenum scrambled into the end zone himself right before the break. Both teams traded touchdowns in the second half and the game was tied at 14 in the closing seconds. And the one play that really sticks out, a muffed punt that we recovered on the 20 and uh, couldn't make anything happen there. Wiley kicker Tyler Driscoll made a field goal from 25 yards out as time expired giving the Bulldogs a 17-14 win, their first football state title, and shattered the dreams and storybook ending Cuero was hoping for. It was tough watching that and hearing their fans. You know, that was the main those, thing. Those oh the man, they were loud, their, their fans were good. You can't take it down off, you can't take, I mean, you lose focus for, for a second in a game like that, it's a loss, like it was. Not only would JT Rudd later play college football at the University of Houston with Case Keenum, he was his roommate. He said Case was a winner. Class act, and that's the worst thing that he could be. <laughs> this guy just ran right around me, and I'm thinking, you know, on paper, I'm faster than this guy. I'm stronger than him. I, there's no way he's beating me, and I'm looking at the back of his jersey, so. He wasn't very fast, he was just very elusive, like Joey said, I mean, it, you, he made you miss no matter what. He was a good one, he was a good kid too. Uh, one of our kids that went up there too, they, they became real good friends. I don't know if I could have. <laughs> Proudest moments of my life here watching my son do it uh, with Coach Reeve was also a very proud moment. We've had a lot of people who have, whose fathers played in the state championships of the 70s, whose kids, you thought I'm saying, played in the late 90s or the early or the 2004 team. Mark Reeve coached Cuero from 2003 to 2009 and recorded seven undefeated district seasons, led the Gobblers to five state semifinal appearances in six years and the 2004 state finals. Reeve was 84 and 11 as a head coach at Cuero and his son Travis Reeve following a two year absence returned where he was once an assistant coach on that 2004 Cuero team. If you want tradition, go to a place that has it. You know, Cuero certainly did and, and, and that, you know, that's where I think the community and their expectations really helped us in our football program. Trey Gray became a standout receiver for Cuero. In fact, he would later become the career leader in receptions and yards receiving for the Richmond Spiders at the collegiate level. The greatest thing about being a gobbler to me was that we not only competed against other teams, but we competed against each other. Cuero running back Fabian Ogeen was a starter in 2004 due to injuries in the Cuero backfield. He made the most of his opportunities. Uh, I was the first out of my family to actually play varsity football and start. So that was a big accomplishment. 
for me. Uh, Fabian Ogin was a, a young sophomore, probably a kid that was going to play on the junior varsity, but ended up coming out and did a really good job for us as a sophomore. Over the next two years, Olguin won a couple of track and field state titles, capping off his senior season of football with close to 1,500 yards rushing and 12 touchdowns. Olguin was selected as the outstanding male athlete on the Victoria Advocates All Area Track and Field Team before heading to Mary Hardin Baylor University, where he roomed with Quero teammate Kyle Nowak. Tragically, Olguin was killed in a car accident following this interview in the fall of 2015 in Carnes County. He is survived by his wife, Monica, parents, Renee and Deborah, and sisters, Brooke and Kayla. Our deepest condolences go out to the entire Olguin family as his memory will live on. The thing about Fabian was is that he epitomized what a gobbler is all about. Not only was he successful uh, on the playing fields, but, uh, but he was one of those guys that was humble and was a tremendous team player, uh, you know, had great faith in the Lord. And, uh, you know, he was a guy that uh, just set that example that made everybody around him better. Tragedy also struck the Gobbler Nation in the summer of 2009, just before the final season for head coach Mark Reeve. Cole Parkman died in an ATV accident while riding at an uncle's ranch near Odessa, Texas. Parkman was the Gobbler's starting running back in 2008 and was 17 years old. I remember uh, that first uh, game of the 2009 season, you know, our kids had really rallied together uh, in honor of him and, and dedicated that season. I can remember some of our kids looking up at the school board and uh, uh, seeing 22 uh, on the school board for the Gobblers. When the Quero Gobblers came out that night and they had one guy holding up the big flag stick and there was not the C from Quero, but his jersey number there in green and white. There was heavy, heavy emotion there, and that carried out through the entire year. A statue that bears his name is located on the home side of Gobbler Stadium. The Gobblers played with heavy hearts in 2009, but never without their beloved teammate, as Cole Parkman's jersey was a constant reminder to never take life for granted. The Gobblers were on a relentless mission that led them back to the state semifinals once again. The 16th state semifinal appearance is on the way as Gobbler fans welcome back another Reeve to the Quero coaching fraternity when the legends of Texas high school football, the Quero Gobbler story continues. Visit downtown Quero on Main Street, the center of entertainment, shopping, dining, and more. Christmas in downtown, the second weekend of December in Quero. A giant 30-foot Christmas tree overlooks an artificial ice skating rink with a snow globe and antique carousel all in view from Santa's workshop. Stroll past arts and crafts vendors from a Christmas train or just take in some outstanding performances. Visit QuerroMainStreet.com and follow us on Facebook. Located in the heart of South Texas, Quero is 90 miles east of the Alamo City. The historical courthouse is one of many classic buildings in the DeWitt County seat. With close to 7,000 residents, Quero is home to great schools, health care, and city parks. You can even kayak down the Guadalupe River. The wildflower capital of the Lone Star State has great economic development incentives to help new businesses thrive. Quero, the heart of South Texas. This is Christmas in downtown and very fitting that the Gobblers are once again playing in the month of December. It's Christmas all over again in 2015. Quero's 2015 season began with renovations in and around Gobbler Stadium as they tried to construct another state championship run, but early losses, including a last second defeat to rival Sinton, nearly bulldozed those title hopes before the foundation was laid. That loss dropped Quero to three and five overall. However, in a five-team district, the Gobblers had already pretty much secured an invitation to the 4A Division II playoffs thanks to a great win over rival Yoakum to open District 14 play. Wins over Ingleside and Jordanton secured second place in District 14. Quero defeated Port Isabel and Devine in the first two rounds of the playoffs as the Gobbler run game pushed the team from DeWitt County into a third round matchup with state-ranked Geronimo Navarro. The 11-0 Panthers had won every game by at least 
least 31 points and averaged 305 yards rushing per contest. A heavy rain fell at Gustafson Stadium in San Antonio throughout the game, but Zach Hopkins looked more comfortable than a duck in water as he totaled 243 yards and three TDs in a 25-13 win. The Gobbler defense allowed only 153 rushing yards and nine first downs as Cuero advanced to December football for the first time in six years and a rematch with a familiar foe. This is a team that's peaking at the right time. You know, you want to be playing your best football in the playoffs, and our football team certainly is. After dealing with the rain in round three, the Gobblers played in the dry Alamo Dome in the quarterfinals against none other than Senton, the same team that beat them in the closing seconds in the regular season. Quarterback Alex Martinez threw an eight-yard touchdown pass to Kieran Grant, who dove the final yard into the scoring zone, 14-0 Gobblers at halftime. Second half, Cameron Mathis ran for 40 yards. This touchdown made it 21-0 Gobblers. The Pirates' hopes of another comeback were sunk when Zach Hopkins picked off Colt Gorman deep in Gobbler territory. The defense held Senton to minus 26 yards rushing in a 28-0 Gobbler win. History did repeat itself as Cuero shut out Senton in the 2004 quarterfinals as well. The win sent Cuero to the state semis and a matchup with heavily favored West Orange Stark at Tully Stadium in Houston. The night before the game, the town of 6800 held a rally for the team on a six game winning streak. We've always had high ex expectations for this team, you know, and we're just putting in the work. So, you know, we're kind of, it's kind of a product of our own work each and every day. Go get you one of these. Go get you one of these and bring it back home. A pair of Alex Martinez touchdown runs gave the Gobblers a 14 to 6 lead midway through the first quarter, but the Mustangs scored three touchdowns in less than six and a half minutes to go up 26 to 14 in the second quarter. Just before halftime, another Martinez run got Cuero to within five, 26-21. Unfortunately for Cuero, they couldn't stop Jack Dallas as he threw for five touchdowns and West Orange Stark ended Cuero's Cinderella season 41 to 28. The Gobblers finished with a record of nine and six. Let's go behind the seasonal stats. Prior to district play, Cuero running back Zach Hopkins suffered through a right knee injury, carrying the ball just 15 times for 76 yards. But in the final nine games of the year, Hopkins had 90 carries for 615 yards and 15 TDs. Cuero's defense also showed major improvements since district play began, allowing just 184 yards and 17 points per game in their final nine contests, compared to allowing 31 points and 308 yards per game in the first six regular season matchups. Cuero, like many teams across the Lone Star State, found out in 2015 due to bad weather that running the football and playing great defense was key to their success. You know, they kept believing in themselves and each other and, uh, you know, what a, what a playoff run that we ended up having. What a great job by head coach Travis Reeve rallying Cuero in the postseason. I'm telling you, I'm proud of you. I told you I loved you when we were two and four because I love you guys. I'm going to tell you something. This is a special group of men. You guys are uncommon. You did something uncommon th this year. We fought to the end. I love every single one of y'all. The Legends of Texas High School Football, the Cuero Gobbler Story, was produced by Jeff Power TV Productions and is dedicated to Mike Weber and all of the Gobbler players and coaches that have gone before us. Here's some final thoughts from Cuero Gobbler Nation. You know, Cuero's a big football town. They, these people love their gobblers, and uh, they make a lot of noise for them. Go Mean Green! Every time we score a touchdown, we do three Go Mean Green yells. And I'm proud to be a gobbler because, you know, I can say my dad played, and then I played. I followed in his footsteps. I have you know, four sons, and I hope that they can come up and be gobblers and, and follow in the tradition that we started here back in the 70s. My dad wasn't able to see me play, but I knew he was there with me and my brother in, in spirit. Because we, we prayed to my dad before each game, and we told him this was for him. Got a call to come work for the Quero record. I was really excited. No, grew up here, so I knew the tradition of Quero sports. In some way, we were like the, the luck charm for the, the gobblers. You know, if, if uh, there was an arroyo or, or a, a sign, someone with the bloodline, uh, we were going to have a good, good season.
they can do it, we can do it, you know. And, and yeah, you work a little harder, but you knew what they had been, and you didn't want to be the one not to go to the state game. And there were signs for miles on the way to the game. When we're leaving for the state game, and we're leaving out going to, uh, to Gonzale, out Gonzales Highway, and you had to go underneath the underpass, and the cheerleaders had a, 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 a banner hanging off that said, last one out, turn out the lights. And that's true, because there wasn't anybody left in town. If anybody could have made it, they were going, they were going to the game. Wearing that C on your helmet was, you know, very important. Nobody wanted to be the bad team, you know, in Quero. You always wanted to be good so that nobody talked about you. You start wanting to, to wear that C, you know, as soon as you're able to go to the football games. <laughs> yeah. Having that C on that helmet and that goblet on the back, it made us all one team for hey, one purpose, one goal, to win championships. Of course, everyone hopes that it will come again. And who knows, it may at any time, that it was almost a magical thing.